Hello and welcome to today's PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Stacey Joyce and I will be your host. Remember that you can ask questions anytime throughout the presentation or the question and answer period using the chat function in our Zoom platform. So you can click on the chat button, select everyone instead of all panelists. That way we can each see what questions are being asked across the country. And, uh, and let us know who's asking the question within your class or perhaps what city or school you're from and we'll give you a shout out when we ask your question. So today's guest is Dr. Emma Allen Verco. She is an associate professor in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology at the University of Guelph and also the co-founder of a biotech company called New Biota, which I will let her tell you about. So thank you so much for joining us. I will let you take it away. Okay. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you'll be able to see my slideshow that I'm going to show. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Full screen. All right, well, I'll take it away then. So thank you very much for having me on this, uh, on this platform. It's great to uh, connect with so many people across the country. It's, it's uh, the wonders of technology. I love it. Um, and I uh, have a little bit of technology to tell you about as well, but in a, bio, in a biological format too. So um, I just have a, a, a 10, maybe 12 minute presentation to give, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to give you some, uh, some concepts that you may not have heard of before. Um, you may not have studied bacteria, for example, before um, uh, in your actual grade level. Um, but don't worry too much because I promise I won't go into too much technical detail, okay? So the first thing I want to tell you is that um, you're not alone. Uh, there are actually more bacteria, these are little tiny uh, single-celled organisms that are living in your gut than there are people on that entire planet. Um, so just take a minute to think about that for a second. That's a huge amount of life that's living inside your gut. Okay, and there's this great cartoon that I'm showing here that uh, was produced by the Human Microbiome Project uh, that, that sort of shows it that uh, 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 maybe it's not such a great place to live because it's very crowded. But actually, bacteria really like it when it's really crowded like that because they really like to be with their friends and share all of the things uh, that they like to do together. So as well as bacteria, there's other types of microbes in your gut. You'll find um, uh, things like fungus and yeast. And so even though you might think that that would be pretty gross, um, in fact, those things do exist in, inside your body, in, inside your gut, but they're healthy. You also have healthy viruses. And I doubt you've ever thought about viruses as being healthy too. And there's lots of other little critters in there as well that, uh, that you've probably never even considered. And they're right now, right now in your body, they're doing an awful lot of work for you. So that means something that's quite challenging to, uh, to think about. And that is that you are in fact not human. So you probably all think that you're human. Um, but I'd like you to stop thinking that and to instead start thinking about the fact that you are a super organism of human and microbial cells. Okay, so what that means is that for every, for every cell in your body that is a human cell, there are about three um, bacterial or microbial cells present as well. So you're in fact more microbial than you are human. The reason that you don't look like a big bacterium is because microbes are very, very, very much smaller well, the microbial cells are much, much smaller than human cells. And so you don't actually look like a microbe. And in fact, the microbes themselves are very, very tiny. And you need a microscope to be able to even see um, uh, the vast majority of them. And uh, that's something that we don't use every day. Now, one of the things that really got me into working in this field is this fact that everybody is different. And uh, yes, you probably think that's a... Yeah, an obvious statement to make. What I mean by that is that the microbes that live in your gut live in what we call an ecosystem. So they're actually living and interacting with each other. And that ecosystem is unique to you. And so you have something called a poo print. Okay, so just like a fingerprint, you have something called a poo print, which uh, everyone thinks is really funny. Uh, but in fact, it is just like a fingerprint because your fingerprint is unique to you. Okay, your poo print is actually unique to you as well. So the person sitting next to you has a very different poo print from you. And if I was to take a poop sample from every single person um, who's joined this webinar and you were to provide your name with it, uh, I could take it to my lab, we could figure out whose poo print is who. And then if you came back to me in a year's time and you gave me another poop sample, and then, uh, but you didn't provide your name, I should still be able to tell whose poop sample is who. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? 
Uh, now your poo print starts to develop. It's not, you're not born with it. It starts to develop just at the time that you're born. And then by the time that you reach the age of three years, it's pretty much developed into its adult form. Now, one of the really important tenets of microbial ecology and ecology in general is something called diversity. And what we mean by that is how many different species or how many different types of microbes there are within a given ecosystem. And what we're really learning in the human microbiome field, and when I say human microbiome, what I'm talking about are all the microbes that live on, on and in the human body. And what we're learning uh, very, very uh, quickly from human microbiome studies, as well as animal microbiome studies, is that if you don't have a lot of different types of microbes on and in your body, you are in fact more likely to get sick. So diversity is really important. And the more types of microbes you have, that means that the, they, they can do a lot more work for you. Um, and, uh, and that actually helps to keep you healthy. Now, when I say work, I don't mean that they're, um, uh, they're running on treadmills or doing anything like that, of course. What I mean is that these microbes are actually carrying out chemical reactions, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of chemical reactions every second. And the products of those chemical reactions are actually really helpful to your health and actually really help uh, to keep you healthy. And so if you've got um, not too many types of microbes, then you have a lot greater chance of getting sick because you're not getting that full complement of chemicals uh, being produced all the time. And you might be, um, you'd be forgiven for thinking that, um, that, that, that germs are bad. I mean, you've been probably brought up to think, okay, I've got to be very careful about washing my hands. And, and, and of course you do, because there are microbes which are bad for you. And those are the ones, unfortunately, that you've heard far more about. And it's still very important to keep washing your hands and to, and to, to uh, maintain uh, hygiene when you're eating, for example, or playing outside, um, or if you get a cut and you don't want to get an infection. But what you have to remember is that not all microbes are bad. And the ones that live inside your gut in particular, for the most part, they're pretty good. And uh, some of them are excellent for you. And so you really have to stop thinking about all microbes as being bad. Now, why do we um, uh, not think of microbes as being bad in the gut? It's because in the gut, they do some really important work. And uh, some of this work, as I mentioned, is through chemical reactions. And um, uh, these are just a few of the sort of over, an overview of the kinds of things that they do. So first of all, they teach your immune systems how to behave properly. So again, if you don't have too many uh, different types of microbes living in your gut and they're not uh, doing all of this work for you. Uh, so if you have less diversity, lots of studies have now shown that those people who have less diversity are the people who are more likely to suffer with asthma and eczema and allergies um, uh, later in life. Um, they, microbes in the gut, obviously, they help us to digest food. So we have, um, if you eat a lot of fiber, which is really good for you, that's actually, fiber is actually what's feeding the microbes in your gut because your body can't digest it, but the microbes can. So if you eat lots of fruits and vegetables that contain a lot of fiber and grains and uh, wholemeal bread, for example, that's really good for your microbes. You're actually providing your microbes with this food so that they can do their work properly for you. So I'd really suggest you do that. Um, if these good microbes are present, then they actually prevent bad microbes from causing us to get sick. So they actually are, uh, they act a little bit like a police force to keep every, all the bad guys in check, if you like. Uh, so it's, a, it's in your best interest to really feed your microbial army really well so that they can do all these important jobs for you. Some microbes actually make vitamins for you, you may not be aware of that, but uh, lots of the B vitamins, for example, are actually made in your gut. And they're made by the microbes that, that live there. And they do many, many other important jobs as well, which I don't have time to go over. Uh, but we're just learning more and more about these every day. And it's really fascinating. So how do we study this uh, gut microbiota? Um, so again, the microbiota term, it just means the microbes that live within the ecosystem. So most of the microbes in our guts, it turns out, are actually very, very difficult to grow in the lab. They, they are anaerobes, which means that uh, oxygen is toxic to them. And actually your gut, believe it or not, is a very anaerobic environment. There's no oxygen really uh, present in the large part of, the, in, the, in the, the last part of your gut. And these microbes really like that environment. These microbes actually also prefer to grow with their friends as they do in nature. And in microbiology labs, we prefer to grow microbes on their own on petri dishes and plates and, and to, to look at them on the, um, under the microscope as, as single uh, species uh, growth cultures. 
And that's not really the way that they like to grow. So in my lab, we study them in a little bit of a different way. We use something called a robo gut. Now here's a robot with a gut full of microbes, but it's actually not at all what it looks like. So let me show you quickly what it looks like. So first of all, just to show you, this is a schematic of your gut. This is what's inside you. So when you swallow food, the food goes down this tube and into your stomach. That's the first part of your gut. And then it exits the stomach and goes to this part of the gut, which we call the small intestine. And then at the end of the small intestine here, there's your little appendix there sticking out there. Uh, this, this part here is actually the, uh, the large intestine and, or the colon. And that's what, uh, what we model in the lab. That is where most of the microbes that live in your gut actually live. There are some microbes, of course, that live in the stomach and a few more that live in the small intestine, but most of them are actually present in the colon. And those are the ones that we study in my lab. Okay, so what we've done is we've created this robo gut, and you can think of that as just a life support system for the, for, the, uh, uh, for the microbes that live in the gut. And here's a schematic of it here. Don't worry too much about it. It's a bit complicated. But what we're doing is we're, we're mimicking all the things that happen in nature. So we have a nice warm temperature because your body temperature is 37 degrees. So that's easy. We can maintain that with this little jacket that sits around the vessel here. We have a bubbler, which is just a, like an air stone in a fish um, aquarium. It's just bubbling in nitrogen gas all of the time. And the reason for that is to, to exclude the oxygen. Because if we push the oh, nitrogen through, that leaves no room for oxygen. And remember, these microbes are anaerobes. They really don't like oxygen present. There's a pH probe here, and that's because the pH of your colon is around neutral. And so microbes that live there don't really like too much acid or too much base. And so we maintain a pH by adding a little bit of acid or a little bit of base as the computer tells us it needs it just to keep it at a constant. And then there's a stir here, a stir bar here, which just keeps everything moving around very gently. Remember, you're moving around in your daily activities every day. So these microbes are not still. And there's also action on the gut um, called peristalsis, and there's actually movement of the gut to push the food through. And so we're mimicking that a little bit as well. So you may have also heard the large part of your intestine or the colon, and so it's just a little picture of what it actually looks like here. You may have also heard it being called your large intestine, as I mentioned, or your bowels. It's exactly the same thing, okay? So uh, what does the robot gut actually look like? This is actually so a picture from my lab. This is a, a vessel um, or a setup of actually four vessels in here. And let me uh, see if I can overlay the vessels there so you can see what they look like, okay? So the vessels are sitting here in this, um, in this system and here's the computer that's running everything. And um, all of this sort of tubing and pipe work and, uh, and, and uh, monitors and things are, are really the life support system that's keeping, that are keeping the microbes alive. So this is where all the media is going through and all the, the media, when I say media, I mean food. Okay, so that's the food that the microbes are being fed. And we're removing all the waste products at the same time and we're pumping in all sorts of other nutrients. So, what we can do with this system is we can model the gut microbiota under different stressful conditions. And remember how I said that if you've got less diversity, that means that you're more likely to get sick. And so what we do in my lab is we're trying to understand how having a less diverse microbiota can actually uh, make you more susceptible to diseases like irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, autism, colorectal cancer, and a number of others. And we can do that in the lab without actually having to hurt anyone because this is a complete uh, host-free system. There's no human involved. What we do is we ask the human to provide a poop sample and some of them don't like to do that very much but uh, because it needs to be very fresh so they really have to come uh, to the lab and go to the washroom down the, down the corridor and sometimes that can be a bit embarrassing. But at the end of the day, um, they, they provide us with a sample and we can put it into the RoboGuard system and we can propagate it for weeks and weeks and actually do lots of good experiments on it. And when we, when we, can, when we can do that, that means that we can start to understand what uh, we can do to keep our gut microbes healthy. And that's really what we, what we aim to do in my lab. Just a quick, uh, quick uh, closer look for you so you can really see what's going on. This is a system that we had um, uh, put some feces into and it's been growing for several weeks at this point. It's interesting to point out that at this point, even though we seeded it with real poop, by this point, the real poop has all gone and all that's left is some microbes. But the microbes still look like the poop. And in fact, they still very much smell like the poop. And if you could uh, have smell-o-vision in my lab, you would see that. 
um, uh, or you would smell that and it's not particularly pleasant. Uh, but it's, uh, it's actually quite important uh, because we, when we, the smell of poop is actually made of molecules uh, which have a very characteristic odour. And if we can smell those molecules, so if that things smell bad, that generally means that the microbes are doing their job and they're behaving well and that they're working. When a microbial ecosystem like this stops smelling bad, then we know that's actually sick and it's uh, not doing its job quite so well. So, uh, so here's a system you can see, there's the, the, the pipes coming in to the top here, this, this is where it's sealed at the top, and this is where the, the food is coming in, and food and the waste is being pumped out at the same time, it's all being stirred. Um, I was going to show some video, but unfortunately we had a bit of a uh, power failure of some equipment over the weekend, so we we're not quite up to, uh, to showing you something in real time at the moment, so you'll have to take my word for it. And finally, this is what it uh, looks like at the other side of the RoboGut. This is where we collect the waste. And, uh, but we actually don't call the waste waste. We call it liquid gold. You can see it's got this kind of golden hue here. Okay, it doesn't, uh, uh, it smells pretty bad. And it, uh, people probably think, oh, well, that really should go down the toilet, not, uh, not be revered as an amazing elixir. But we actually use it for a lot of incredible experiments. And in fact, of all the things in my lab, this is the thing that most other labs in the world, when they ask me for things, this is what they ask me for. The reason is that the microbes that have been living in this soup have actually been making all of those chemicals. And they make those chemicals in part to communicate with each other. So if we can decipher the chemical language or the chemical components of that broth, that liquid gold, then we can actually start to understand the conversations that the microbes are having with each other. And that can really help us to provide biomarkers to understand how um, microbes might be having changing their conversations when uh, things are going badly and, they're getting, and people are getting sick. So that's all I wanted to say. I just wanted to show this last slide. These are some actual images that we took of a few of the different bacterial species that actually come from feces so you can see what they look like. Uh, these are images that have been taken under using an electron microscope, which is a very powerful kind of microscope. Because these are very, very tiny, tiny cells, a few microns across. And uh, so you can see some of them have these incredible sort of appendages. You can see this one, this one, this one, they have these appendages. Those are called flagella. They actually help those microbes swim around. And uh, some of them are kind of joined together like this. And uh, th these are just getting ready to divide. And you can see that this one here is actually uh, starting to produce what we call an endospore. This is how it uh, uh, propagates um, uh, under some circumstances. It forms these endospore structures that are like uh, suspended animation for the cell. So with that, that's what I wanted to show you. So let me see. Do I uh, stop sharing this now? What do I do now? Yes, please. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Uh, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little bit glad that we're seeing all these images from afar. As uh, <laughs> I mentioned, it's a very smelly lab. <laughs> but uh, thank you for showing us everything. We already have a question coming in from the students in Burford, Ontario, in Mr. McCleary's class. And they would like to know if all mammals share the same types of microbes, or are they specific to certain animals? Now, that's a really interesting question. And in fact, um, humans have a very specific type of microbiota. And our closest relatives, which would be the primates, the apes, the great apes, they have quite a different microbiome as well. And in fact, you can separate um, animals um, apart from each other by looking at their microbiomes. They all have very, very different microbiomes. And it's related to the types of diet that they eat, but as well as, um, interestingly enough, how far away in evolution they split from their next uh, closest ancestor. So they do have very different microbes. Uh, there are some uh, species of microbes that might be shared amongst, um, amongst all animals. Um, there's a particular microbe that uh, we know of, it's called Acomantia mucinophila. And that one is um, uh, every animal that uh, we've studied so far actually has this species. Um, but the species itself varies very slightly. So it has a very slightly different strain according to the animal that it comes from. So, it's, uh, so you'd even see differences at that level. Oh, very interesting. So similarities, but definitely, definitely differences overall from animal to animal. Yes. Now, in sort of a similar vein, you were mentioning poo prints. Yes. And I wanted to ask if they ever change slightly 
Uh, so the same individual, but perhaps they've done a 180 in their diet and they've added a whole lot more fiber consistently. Do you still have a recognizable poo print that's the same? Um, that's not a really good question. And the answer is yes, um, you do. That, that poo print is maintained because it's, it's really to do with the types of species that you have there and not the abundances of those, of those species. So when you change your diet radically, you're not actually changing the species that are present in your gut, but you're actually changing the numbers of each species relative to each other. So you'll see a difference in the abundance profile, we call it, but you won't see a difference in the overall species. However, there is one, one or two um, occasions when you really can change your microbiome and not usually for the better. And that's when you take an antibiotic. Uh, when, you, when we take antibiotics, we're learning that um, as well as obviously helping us to get over the infection, which we've been given the antibiotic to treat, they actually do sometimes have profound effects on the microbiome. And those profound effects may or may not return back to baseline after you stop taking the antibiotic. This is still a very new area of research and it depends on the antibiotic. It depends on the person and it depends very much on the circumstances under which they're given the, the antibiotic. So I wouldn't ever say that it's an important thing to stop taking antibiotics because antibiotics are life-saving drugs. But it's very important to only take antibiotics if you really need them because we don't know quite what they're going to do to the microbiome and they, they, that could be damage that might not be able to be undone. Excellent. Thank you for that explanation. Um, we've got a couple more questions here already. Um, a classroom in Ottawa, Ontario would like to know what got you interested in this field of work? Yeah, what got me interested? Well, um, I actually have a terrible gut. So um, I've suffered for years with uh, a disease called irritable bowel syndrome. And uh, so I've always been very interested in, uh, in understanding the reasons for that. But beyond that, when, when I started out, I was actually looking at bacterial pathogens. These are the bad guys. These are the ones that cause disease in the gut. And, um, and I was very interested in these bacterial pathogens, but I was also very aware that everyone was studying these pathogens, yet by numbers, there's a very, very tiny fraction of what's actually out there. Nobody was studying the good guys uh, because nobody knew what they did and nobody could grow them. And so um, when somebody tells me that it's impossible to grow something, so don't even bother trying to study it, then that makes me want to do it even more. So that's what I set out to do in my lab is to culture these so-called unculturable microbes, which as you can see, we've done pretty well so far. So. Awesome. Uh, Emerson from Ajax would like to know how long, or sorry, uh, yes, how long did it take to make the robo gut? How long did it take? Well, uh, from the concept to actually getting it up and running for the first time, um, the, the, you can, we actually buy the equipment off the shelf from a company called Enforce in, uh, in Switzerland, but we don't use it for the purpose for which it's designed. So we actually modify the equipment to use it as a robot gut. And um, it took us about uh, two years to, to really understand all of the things that go into it. So running the equipment was one thing, but then we had to figure out the kind of diet that we wanted to feed it and how often we had to feed it and how we had to feed it, how much we had to stir it, all of those kinds of things. And uh, those experiments themselves, when we do a chemostat run or a, a, a robogut run, um, they can be a four to six week long experiment. So it does take quite a bit of time. Great. And we talked a little bit about how that microbiome changes with antibiotics. So Mr. McCleary's class in Burford would like to know if eating yogurt really helps you to restore your microbes after a dose of antibiotics. Okay, well, so if you eat live yogurt, then it obviously contains some microbes in there. That's why it's called live uh, yogurt. And that could be uh, bifidobacteria or lactobacillus. Now, those microbes themselves, uh, they're microbes, although they're the same kinds of species that are present in the gut, they're actually very different types of strains. And the ones that you get in yogurt don't really survive very well in the gut. And in fact, um, it's a little bit of a myth that when you take a probiotic that it's going to colonize your gut. It probably isn't, I'm afraid. Um, it's not to say that it's a bad thing. Um, they certainly don't do you any harm if you're healthy. And so it's a, it's a good thing to take them. But only very few probiotics have ever had any um, real uh, clinical science done on them because it's very expensive to do those kinds of trials. And, um, and so those probiotics tend to be the more expensive ones and you don't tend to find those in yogurt. 
What I would say, though, is that remember I was telling you that these microbes are doing all of this work. They're doing that, that kind of work in yogurt as well. And when they're doing that kind of work in yogurt, they're also making these beneficial uh, compounds, these, these, um, uh, these chemical compounds within that yogurt too. One of those chemical compounds um, is, is called lactate. Obviously, that's the product that you get from taking lactose, which is the main sugar in, in milk, and it turns it into lactate. And lactate uh, can be used as a fuel source for lots and lots of other microbes in the gut. And so indirectly, by eating yogurt, you may be stimulating the growth of other microbes in your gut. Excellent. Um, so maybe not the intention or not, not the mode of, um, of effectiveness that people are thinking of, but there still is some, some effectiveness there anyway. Yes, and there's, there's some other foods as well. So it's not just yogurt. There's uh, things like kefir and uh, kombucha tea and all of these other um, probiotic uh, uh, containing foods. So we call them functional foods um, that, uh, that you can take that, uh, that may or may not have an effect on the microbiota. What I would say is that whilst they're pretty much harmless, so there's nothing to say that you shouldn't take them, um, remember everyone is different. And so if you have an aunt or an uncle or a mum or a dad who takes some probiotic and says, oh, they swear by it and they think it's great, it, may, it doesn't mean that that's going to work for you because you have a very different blueprint. And so for, for probiotics, it's very much a case of you have to keep trying lots of different ones to see which one works best for you. That makes sense. So what I do want to make sure we touch on um, is the idea of repopulate and your endeavor with new biota. Perhaps you can tell us what that's all about. Yes, I haven't talked about that yet. So what we are trying to do is, so it's pretty gross, people are going to be very grossed out by this, but there is a process that you can, uh, or a medical um, process that you can have done uh, called a fecal transplant. Okay, you may or may not have heard of that. This is when someone with a sick gut, so less diversity, so not, not, not a very diverse gut, and they're very sick usually, um, they can have all sorts of infections or whatever. Um, but the way to deal with that um, is to actually give them a poop sample um, from a healthy donor. So they literally take poop from a healthy donor, blend it up in a blender, um, and then give it via enema or through what we call crapsules, which are these poop pills that go into little um, gelatin capsules that you can take by mouth. And you can give them to, um, to these sick patients and these microbes as a community will colonize the gut in a way that probiotics can't do. And, but the problem with that, apart from the fact that it's pretty icky um, and, um, uh, and people really don't like to think about doing that, is that it, we don't know what the long-term safety uh, consequences of doing that are because there are so many different species in a poop sample. So what New Biota has done and what we've done in my lab is we've taken very simplified ecosystems of 30 to 40 different strains and we've purified them completely so they no longer look like poop. And we put them into uh, capsules and uh, we're doing clinical trials right now where we're testing them to see if they have an effect, the same effect as a, as a fecal transplant but with less risk. And so that's what New Biota has been created to do to make these ecosystem therapeutics, which again, are gonna be taken by mouth. So you don't even have to think about the other end. Um, and you can um, uh, hopefully then uh, restore diversity in your gut, which will help you help you to restore health. Very interesting. Uh, we'll have to see how that all turns out. You're in your clinical trials now, so I'm sure you're anxious to, uh, to find out as well. So I'm going to go back to a couple more questions before we sign off today. Uh, we have the Elgin Enrichment class. They're in Simcoe, and they're wondering if you can breed microbes to create a hybrid species. Oh, now that's a very interesting question. So actually microbes do this naturally all the time. Uh, microbes are unlike, um, or bacteria anyway, unlike animals, are very, very good at sharing genes. And they do this just by being, having systems that enable them to pick up genes that might be floating around in their environment around them and uh, just to be able to pick them up and incorporate them into their own genomes and then they can sort of use them and try them out. And if they're no good, then they throw them out again. So the microbes and particularly some species of bacteria are extremely good at this. And this is why bacteria evolve very, very fast. And actually this is one of the reasons we're so worried about antibiotic resistance because some of the genes that they take up 
from the environment tend to be for resistance to antibiotics, and that's why antibiotic resistance spreads as easily as it does. Uh, so making hybrid um, uh, bacteria or microbes like that, um, it's not really a case of mating two microbes together because microbes don't, um, um, or bacteria anyway, sorry, don't reproduce sexually, they reproduce asexually. And so they basically split up and we call it binary fission. And they, so you have one cell that, that divides and makes two cells and those two cells go off and divide and so on and so forth. And so really for bacteria, it's more about asexual reproduction and acquiring genes from the environment. Excellent. I'm trying to squeeze, squeeze in as much as I can today before we sign off. We've got our students in Ottawa who would like to know what causes Crohn's disease. And can your research help someone with this illness? Okay, well, Crohn's disease actually is what I started out studying uh, uh, when I started my independent career. And uh, so unfortunately, we don't know the answer to that. But what we do know, and we know far more now than we knew 10 years ago even, uh, is that uh, whatever is going wrong in Crohn's disease is a mixture between something wrong with the genome of the host, so your genetic, cap your genetic susceptibility, uh, something wrong with the microbes that are actually present in the gut and then something in the environment that triggers those two susceptibilities to come together to create the disease. And we know that uh, Crohn's disease actually isn't just one disease now. We know that it's actually many different types of diseases that all have very similar um, uh, kinds of symptoms that we lump under this umbrella term of Crohn's disease. So perhaps we should call it Crohn's diseases. Um, and for all of them, we have there are very slight differences in the microbiota changes as well as the host uh, genetic changes. And so we're just trying to understand now how that's all coming together. Uh, one of the things that we think it might be is an, uh, the immune system, like a, um, the immune, your, your own immune system is very complicated. One tiny part of that, you have genetic susceptibility, one tiny part of that goes wrong, and then you combine that with a less diverse microbiota, then you get an amplified effect. And so one of the things that we're looking for right now is, uh, or looking to do, and uh, not in my lab, but in general um, in the field, is to try to increase the diversity of the microbiota to compensate for the lack that, uh, or the, the, the mutation that you may have in the immune system uh, that, that's compromising the immune system. But it's a very complicated process because there's so many different moving parts. And so it's not going to happen very soon, uh, but it's coming. And we certainly know far more now now, uh, than we did 10 years ago about how to approach treating this disease. It always seems to be the answer with research of this kind. That yes, and unfortunately, uh, I, I, know that, I know that that's really kind of a trite response, but I don't know, actually, it's a good point to bring up. I think people think that, that uh, research tends to take place and it might be something that takes months. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, but it's an ongoing process. Science is an ongoing process. It can take a very, very long time to start off um, uh, with an experiment. Usually when you do an experiment that opens up many, many other doors and you have to explore in all of those doors before you can complete that experiment. And it just uh, complete, it, it carries on that way. And so, uh, so science can be frustratingly slow. If you're actually working in it, it seems to be uh, sometimes, sometimes quick, sometimes slow, uh, but there's a, there's a lot of work that we still need to do. Right. So before we sign off today, I'd just like to give you an opportunity to perhaps tell our students um, maybe what you really like about what you do or any advice for them if they'd like to pursue science, whether it is in microbiota or a different area of science, if they just like the idea of experimenting. What, uh, what little nuggets might you have for them? Today? Little nuggets. Okay, well, what I would say is that uh, the internet and, and connectivity has, has made science an incredibly different field. And science is much more collaborative now. And that means that I work with people across the country all the time, across the world all the time. And um, it means that the amount of data that we can collect it's actually a huge amount of data. So the one piece of advice that I could give is to not be frightened of the, the, the amount of data and to learn, um, I mean, not at this level, but uh, as you go through to consider 
uh, doing some studies in what we call bioinformatics because this is an area uh, which we really, really need some very smart people who are, um, and, and really this, this generation that I'm talking to right now, you're the smart guys because you know how to use sort of all this technology and you're very, you have the kind of brain set to do it. And then to apply uh, mathematics and statistics uh, to those, to, to looking at that big data that sounds frightening, but it, it really isn't. I just think that if you are, if you train yourself from the early stages uh, to really look and, and understand computer language, understand how to use computers and understand how to apply math and stats, then you will have a far uh, greater uh, range to draw from if you want to become a scientist later on. And uh, it's a very exciting time. I think it's uh, we're really at a, for, certainly for microbiology, this is what we call the renaissance in microbiology. We're really seeing a change in the way that we're viewing uh, microbes right now. So all become microbiologists. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> microbiologists who know a little bit of computer science. Computer science is the computers are going to be our friends. So they already are, but I think even more so as, as, the, as time goes on. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. And uh, I guess in layman's terms for talking about poop. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> And uh, just to let everyone know, next week we are talking about minerals and missions to Mars. If you'd like more information on this or other upcoming PIR live events, you can find that information at pirweb.org. Thanks for joining us today and have a good one. Bye, everybody. <laughs>